Hotep. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and, and historian. It is Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. So I wanted to come on and uh, give you an update on the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, and uh, do an overview, uh, do a preview of the class. So it meets on Tuesdays, um, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And, uh, some of you are registered for it, and uh, some more of you have been asking questions about it. And we deal with thousands of years of history uh, in the online course, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, and we deal with the transatlantic slave trade also. So uh, next class is Tuesday, February 23rd, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tuesday, February 23rd, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And my guest speaker is going to be Dr. David M. Hotep author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, okay? So, um, I do a PowerPoint presentation in the course. We have video clips, uh, book references, and uh, we deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the, uh, the Nile Valley region of Africa. We deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we take you through our time and deal with what led to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. OK. All right. So I had Dr. David M. Hotep on my radio show on Sunday, uh, Sunday, February 21st. And uh, some of you all heard that. And that's the show's archived at our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network on Facebook and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, so we posted the information here. We'll post the link here. You can register for the uh, online course. And it is, um, it, it, we do the classes live. You can ask questions during the class. And then all the ses all the classes are archived. So you can go back and watch it over and over again. Okay. It's regularly $130. It's on, it's on sale $80. We just posted the link here so you can register for it. As soon as you register, you can start watching um, last week's class. Uh, last week, we had Sister Nubia Wartford uh, as our guest speaker, who is a cultural anthropologist. She's a cultural anthropologist, and we dealt with um, the origins of ancient Kush and the uh, queens of antiquity. OK. All right. So we're going to I'm going to switch over to the uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Just a second here. It's freezing up here, so just give me a minute. How's everybody doing? Then also you can uh, register. This is an eight-week online course. And you can also register uh, per class. We're going to make it available. You can register per class, and uh, for the, uh, each class would be $15 if you want to register per class. But you can watch from around the world, and you can watch these sessions over and over again as well. They'll be archived. Okay, just a second here. Uh, hold on, the screen's freezing up. Just give me a minute. All right. All right. We should be back. Let's try and turn on the screen share and the uh, screen froze up. OK, so let's go to the PowerPoint presentation because I, I, I do a PowerPoint presentation in the uh, class also. All right. And this um, online course evolved out of a four hour lecture that I did that was about seven years of research. OK, uh, so let's pull this up here. All right. So this is I, I did a lecture back in 2014 called Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. It's actually about a four and a half hour uh, lecture. 
And it was about seven years of research compiled. And then this online course evolved out of that. So Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, uh, will be our guest speaker in the, in the online class um, uh, Tuesday, February 23rd, okay, uh, today. And we'll post this link here uh, once again also since I had to refresh the screen. So, and I'm going to give you an overview of some of the things that we deal with in general in the online course, okay? All right. Um, now, one of the reasons why this type of information is so important, uh, you've heard me talk about the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center called Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery. And here's the study right here. This is a about a 56-page study that documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. OK, it documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in, in, in schools all across the country. And they did a survey of 1000 high school seniors. I'm going to show you some of the information that they found out uh, in the study. They did a, a survey of 1000 high school seniors and they found out just how little they actually know about slavery, uh, the history of slavery. And this ties into the history of this country. OK, so I, I first found out about this study. In um, 2018, it, it came out right about February 2018 for African American History Month. Also, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some background information on African American History Month, uh, founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson uh, in February 1926. Uh, that was the first uh, Negro History Week, which became African American History Month. Um, so I'm going to give you some background information on that S since this is the month of February. And a lot of people are asking, what am I what am I going to do for February since I haven't been traveling, since I've been speaking out of town? So I'm doing my online course. So the last time I taught this course was uh, 2019. So a lot of new information has come out, just like the um, the discovery from that came out last week about the uh, ancient beer factory found in Egypt that dates back about 5000 years ago. So there's so much new information that's come out since the last time I taught this class. All right. Uh, OK, so let's post this here. So there was a there, there was this article from uh, the Atlantic dot com that came out. And this is how I found out about this study. And it's called What Are Kids Really Learning About Slavery? What Are Kids Really Learning About Slavery? A new report finds that the topic is mistaught and often sentimentalized and students are students are alarmingly misinformed as a result as a result students are alarmingly misinformed as a result so uh it talks about this new report from the southern poverty law center and they did a survey of 1000 high school students they also did a survey of uh 1700 social studies teachers across the country 1000 high school seniors across the country and 1,700 uh, social studies teachers. And the group also reviewed 10 commonly used U.S. history textbooks and examined 15 sets of state standards to assess uh, what students know about educators teaching, uh, what publishers include in these textbooks, and what standards require vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, slavery, teaching about the history of slavery. So they found out that only 8% of high school seniors surveyed, only 8% of high school seniors surveyed uh, could identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War. Only 8% of high school seniors surveyed. Fewer than one third of high school seniors surveyed, or 32% correctly named the 13th Amendment as the formal end of the U.S. Civil War. They thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation, which did not end the U.S. Civil War. It took a constitutional, which did not end slavery, I should say. It took a constitutional amendment to end slavery. OK, uh, so 35 percent thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation and fewer than half or only 46 percent identified the Middle Passage as the as the transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to North America. So if you read this full article. What kids are really learning about slavery from the Atlantic.com, February 1st, 2018. 
this gives you some background information and it shows why this study is so important. And I use this study as one of, as one of the uh, sources in uh, the online course. Uh, this is why this study is so important. And you can download it. I downloaded it and uh, took it to the printer, got it printed up. It's called Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. Teaching Hard History of American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. All right. So let's continue here. Uh, and then we see that there's a we see an impact on our children learning their history and an increase in their self-esteem and how they do in school. There's a correlation between that as well. So this was a study from uh, this. This was an article from the root dot com. I'm not a big fan of the root. Maybe now and then they do have some good articles. Um, new study finds that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. Positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. So oftentimes people ask me, why is this type of information important? Why is it important for us to learn our history? Why is African American History Month important? And, and I'm going to give you some background history on African American History Month or Black History Month. And we'll talk a little bit about Dr. Carter G. Woodson as well. So everybody share this broadcasting and social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in also. Um, but they don't ask the question, why is it important for white people to learn their history? Why is it important for Asians to understand their history and the Chinese and the Japanese and Koreans? Why is it important for them to understand their history? They don't ask that question. Now, believing that black is beautiful, an important mantra of self-acceptance and self-love could pay major dividends in school, a new study finds. An article in the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education focuses on a new study from Sherita Butler Barnes, uh, African-American woman, who is a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, which finds that young black women with strong racial identity young black women with strong racial identity are more likely to be academically engaged, curious, and persistent. Now, the survey looked at 733 African-American middle and high school uh, girls uh, in the middle school and high school in three socioeconomically uh, school districts in the Midwest, according to the Journal of Blacks and Higher Education. Now, the study is called Promoting Resilience Among African-American Girls, Racial Identity as a Protective Factor. Promoting Resilience Among African-American Girls, Racial Identity as a Protective Factor. And the study was published on the Child Development Journal website. And this study found that feeling positive about being black. And when it, if you're going to use black as a descriptor for African people, always capitalize the being black. They found that feeling positive about being black, along with feeling supported by their schools, correlated with the girls' greater academic motivation. It correlated with the girls' greater academic motivation. Researchers also found that feeling good about your racial identity could uh, could act as a buffer for students in hostile or negative academic environments. OK, feeling good about your racial identity, feeling good about being African, feeling good about being black, African-American, African-American could act as a buffer for students in hostile or negative economic environments, academic environments, I should say uh, persons of color who have unhealthy racial identity beliefs tend to perform lower in school and have more symptoms of depression, a professor Sharita Butler Barnes noted in the study. We found that feeling positive about being black and feeling support and belonging at school may be especially important for African-American girls uh, African-American girls classroom engagement and curiosity. Feeling connected to the school may also work together with racial identity attitudes to improve academic outcomes. 
So you can read this full article, and in the article, they have a link to the study. This is from January 10th, 2018. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. But the same thing applies for African-American boys as well. Okay, if we go look at this article here from BlackAmericaWeb.com from June 14th, 2012, that deals with a study that came out uh, back in 2012, a new precise and exhaustive year long study finds that watching television regularly distorts and ultimately destroys the self-esteem of young black males who often find themselves comparing one another to the characters they view on air on TV leaving them feeling trapped and as if there are, quote, very, very few positive life paths they can aspire to. Very few positive life paths they can aspire to. So read this article from BlackAmericaWeb.com. TV kills black boys' self-esteem, June 14, 2012. There are a number uh, of outlets that, that reported on this study. Now, what's interesting is that when CNN, CNN.com wrote about this study, uh, it, their article said that uh, TV improved the self-esteem of white boys, young white boys, but not uh, people of color and white girls. And on the uh, in the article, CNN, in the article from CNN, they had a picture of a little white boy wearing like a Superman uniform, Superman costume with, with the cape, and he's laying on the floor watching television. Because when you read this study, it talks about how it's only young white males who uh, t watching TV boost their self-esteem because these are the majority of the images that they see. And they see themselves being doctors and, and lawyers and uh, see themselves being judges and scientists and, and saving the world and different things like that. But they talk about how it damages the self-esteem for young white girls, African-American boys and girls, and, and non-white non -white males. So then you look at studies that deal with how African-American, African-Americans, watch a disproportionate amount of television than other racial groups and other ethnic groups. So this is why African American History Month is so important. This is why uh, this type of information is so important. Okay. All right, let's continue here. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platform. So I'm doing an overview of um, the online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. This is a eight-week, 16-hour online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history. And our Tuesday, February 23rd class, our guest speaker is going to be Dr. David M. Hotel, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, okay? And we'll, we'll uh, he'll do he'll show some slides and we'll deal with thousands of years of our history. And uh, he was my guest on my radio show Sunday night. OK, you can register for this online course. Um, as soon as you register, you can start watching uh, last week's class. Last week, our guest speaker was uh, cultural anthropologist, Sister Nubia Wartford. And then um, there's some bonus content as well. Okay, so we posted the link here. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, right on the homepage of our website. Uh, you can register there uh, also. You can watch from around the world. We do the class live on Tuesdays, uh, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then uh, the session is, uh, they're, they're all archived, so you can go back and watch it over and over again. You can watch, you can um, a a ask questions in class through the live chat. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, video clips. Uh, it's about 50 articles that I reference, et cetera, okay? All right, let's continue here. So that's just a, a little background information of the impact that this type of information has on children and children grow up to be adults, hopefully. Uh, so then this, th this study right here, this came out in uh, 2013, late 
2012, early 2013. Black teens with racial pride do better in school. Black teens with racial pride do better in school. AfricanGlobe.net had this article. African-American teenagers perform better academically when their parents instill in them a sense of racial pride. African-American teenagers perform, perform better academically when their parents instill in them a sense of racial pride. Now, uh, wait till you see who conducted this study. This was a joint study between the University of Pittsburgh and Harvard University. This came out in late 2012. This was a joint study between the University of Pittsburgh and Harvard University. Go research this. This study shows that when parents use racial socialization, such as talking to their children or engaging in activities that promote feelings of racial knowledge, pride and connection, feeling feelings of racial knowledge, pride and connection, like going to Kwanzaa events, going to African-American History uh, Month uh, celebrations, going to uh, lectures dealing with African history, African-American history, all different types of things like that. OK, when. Uh, when parents use racial socialization, such as talking to their children or engaging in activities that promote feelings of racial knowledge, pride and connection, it offsets racial discrimination's potentially negative impact on students academic development. All right. So check out that article also. All right. So. Here's an overview of some of the things that we deal with in the uh, online course, the eight week, 16 hour online course, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, uh, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, Jerome, you just came in late at the beginning. I said I'm going to deal with Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the history of African-American history. So uh, you, you're late. All right. So here's some of the things that we deal with in the online course. And once again, like I said, we deal with thousands of years of history, uh, over is over 50,000 years of history that we deal with because we're going to have Dr. David M. Hotep speaking uh, uh, today at uh, today's class. What was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus uh, play? Um, uh, when did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? Uh, were African people in America before the uh, slave trade? Yes, we were. We were here for tens of thousands of years. Um, this was our land stolen from us. And if you saw the interview that uh, I did uh, Sunday, our Sunday, February 21st show, and other interviews, I, I dealt with this numerous times also. And this is uh, Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Uh, his new book will be out the end of March, uh, by the end of March 2021. His new book will be out, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. But we were here even before Native Americans came into existence. OK, and if you look at the discovery in Allendale County, South Carolina, by Dr. Albert Goodyear. And I'll show that to you in just a minute. They found evidence of an African presence in the Americas dating back at least 51,700 years ago. OK, these were the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet and uh, come from uh, southern Africa, go all around the world. All right, let's continue here. So the we also deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, because we try to take you through history chronologically. When we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start in the in the 15th century. We can't start in 1441 with the Portuguese going into Mauritania. We can't start in 1619 in uh, Virginia with those 20, 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes, as they're called, um, on the on the white lion pirate ship, the white lion pirate ship. Being exchanged for food and and and. Uh, uh, being exchanged for food and and uh, supplies and water and things like this. We have to deal with hundreds of years of history before that and thousands of years of history before that. But the, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors is crucial to understanding the transatlantic slave trade. OK, so uh, we also deal with shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. 
Because when these archaeological discoveries come out, and just like if you look at the one that came out uh, last week dealing with the ancient beer factory that was found in Egypt, they, they back 5,000 years ago. Um, it, the, the scientists and the archaeologists and the paleontologists, et cetera, they say these discoveries are causing us to rethink everything. These discoveries are causing us to rethink everything. So uh, I, I always say the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. They find out that a lot of these monuments, they find out a lot of these structures uh, uh, are much older than what we've been told. So they keep having to push the timelines back. You remember Juvenile um, had a song back in like about 1999, back that thing up. They keep having to back the timelines up. They keep having to push the timelines back when these new archaeological discoveries uh, take place. Okay, so uh, so uh, we deal with that. In Sunday, I talked about the um, discovery of the 17 pyramids buried underneath Egypt. And that discovery is made in 2011. How many people are familiar with that? 17 pyramids found buried, buried underneath Egypt. So what's interesting is that all the news outlets will carry will run these stories. Uh, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, um, uh, all, 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 all of these news outlets, National Geographic, uh, Smithsonian Institute, Smithsonian Mac, all of them will run these stories. OK, now you may see 30 seconds of it on TV. So for, so for instance, for, and, and I'm going to switch over, I'm going to show you uh, the article dealing with the uh, ancient beer factory, okay? Uh, the article dealing with the ancient beer factory, uh, the Associated Press reported on this and a lot of other outlets picked up on it. I saw about 30 seconds of it on MSNBC. They did talk about it on MSNBC, but it was about for 30 seconds. But they have an article on uh, NBC, uh, NBCnews.com about, about the discovery, okay? But they only had 30 seconds of it on MSNBC. Ancient beer factory unearthed by archeologists in Egypt. Now this is from uh, February 14th, 2021, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass' birthday, his assumed birthday, because he didn't know the actual date of his birth or the actual year. He knew it was either 1817 or 1818. Some people refer to this as Valentine's Day. Now, American and Egyptian archaeologists have unearthed what could be the oldest known beer factory at one of the most prominent archaeological sites of ancient Egypt, a top antiquities official said Saturday. Mustafa Waziri, a secretary of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, said the factory was found in Abydos, an ancestral burial ground located in the desert west of the Nile River, over 280 miles south of, south of Cairo. He said the factory apparently dates back to, now check this out, they, 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 they bought the, a lot of this stuff is not hidden. You just have to know where to look, okay? A lot of this stuff is not hidden. They, they're, about to, they're about to drop some real history right here, okay? In this article in mainstream media. Let's look at this. He said the factory apparently dates back to the region of King Narmer, who is widely known for his unification of ancient Egypt, uh, unifying upper and lower Kemet, upper and lower Egypt, at the beginning of the first dynastic period between 3150 BC and 2613 BC. Okay. And they have a, a little video here as well, it's 38 seconds. Archaeologists found eight huge units each is about 65 feet uh 65 feet long and eight feet wide okay um the joint mission is co-chaired by dr uh, matthew adams of the institute of fine arts okay and deborah vishak uh assistant professor of ancient egyptian art history and archaeology at princeton university okay so so at Princeton, so when you study these when you look at these Ivy League schools, Princeton, Harvard, things like this. See, they have professors there that are studying ancient Egypt. Okay? 
in doing archaeology in ancient Egypt or, or, or archaeology dealing with ancient Egypt. Now, Adam said the factory was apparently built in the area to provide royal rituals with beer, given that archaeologists found evidences showing the use of beer in sacrificial rites of ancient Egyptians. Now, they will also use beer for medicinal purposes as well. Um, okay, let me skip down. Okay, now let's look at this right here. Now, they put this in a mainstream news article with this vast cemeteries and temples from the earliest times of ancient Egypt. Abydos was known for monuments honoring Osiris, ancient Egypt's god of the underworld, and the deity responsible for judging souls in the afterlife. Okay, so you're talking about Osar, Osiris, the Greeks called him Osiris, the father of Heru, okay, and the husband of Aset, and you're talking about the first holy trinity. So they're dealing with this, and you're dealing with the afterlife, and, the, and then this ties into the judgment scene. Okay, that famous scene, the judgment scene, where they're wearing, where, where, where they are weighing the heart of someone who has died against the feather of Ma'at. Okay, they put this is in the article from Associated Press, as reported by NBC News. So let's go back to this here, because all this is tied together. And one of the things that I do in the class is, is is we take articles that we see in the in the news and tie that into history and tie that into ancient history because it's all right there a lot of this stuff is not hidden you just have to know where to look for it okay so let me show you something how's everybody doing okay those just tuning in once again uh i'm michael m hotel founder of the african history network host of the african history network show talk show host researcher lecture writer and historian I'm doing an overview of, a, of an eight week, 16 hour online course that I teach. I'm doing a preview called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, uh, you can register for it at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And we just posted a link here. Um, so and we do with thousands of years of history. All the sessions, or we do them live on Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But uh, they're also archived, so you can go back and watch them over and over again as well. Okay, let me uh, show you something here. Uh, with ancient Kemet. Bam, here we go. So what they talked about in the article from um, NBC News ties right into this the first holy trinity now what i say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness just because you never heard it before or disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true it just means you have to do some research to understand what i'm talking about so we take you throughout history this ties into african spirituality as well and it's going to be african spirituality they're going to take uh, fragments from the periphery of African spirituality to form Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. But we see Aset, who the Greeks called Isis, okay, she gave birth to Heru uh, of a virgin birth on December 25th. And you're going to have this story told over and over and over again, adapted to various people's cultures. So when you read... Uh, when you read Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, and I've got the book around here somewhere. Here we go. When you read Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, okay, or, and then also this one right here, because uh, when I was doing my research to really study the real, the, the deep history of Christmas and the pre-Christian uh, winter solstice festivals, that was celebrated of uh, the festival of Saturnalia. Um, the, these the, uh, when you deal with uh, the uh, Yule, the festival of Yule, and the festival of Mithra amongst the Persian Persians and things like this. Uh, this book right here, Christmas Miscellany, everything you always always want to know about Christmas, but all this history and mythology ties into the origins of Christmas. And then you read Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, which deals with how. A lot of these stories 
are from uh, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, from Mesopotamia, Sumer, and told over and over and over again, adapted to various people's cultures. And they deal with, uh, and this one here, I think he deals with like about 27 crucified saviors. Okay. The, these stories told, adapted to various people's cultures and told over and over again. But we see that from this story here of the first holy trinity, Osara, Oset, and, Heru, Oset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, we see that we get the, the, the statue of Oset. Uh, with the baby Heru, and we see that uh, uh, Dis um, not Disney, uh, DC Comics, DC Comics creates the character, the superhero or superheroine of Isis, and I still have comic books. I still have my Captain Marvel and, and Isis comic books from the 70s. And then there was a TV show, a Saturday morning TV show in the 70s, called The Secrets of Isis. And in this TV show, they had this white woman who got her powers from ancient Egypt because when you watch the beginning of the show, they start talking about uh, ancient uh, Kemetic deities and they talk about uh, Hathor, uh, things like this. They talk about the Netaru and they say that she got her powers from ancient Egypt. Okay, she can fly. She has all these superpowers. And they show symbols from ancient Egypt, but they don't tell you that the ancient Egyptians were African people. They just lead you to believe they were white. And you have this, this white woman that has powers from ancient Egypt. So the ancient Egyptians must have been white. OK, we don't we, we won't tell them that they weren't white. We'll just let them believe whatever they want to believe and keep showing these images. But this this picture right here, this is from the uh, uh, the official box set of the DVD box set of the uh, complete series, The Secrets of Isis. And a few years ago, they had this series on Hulu, the streaming service Hulu. And I watched some of them and I hadn't seen it in like years, years and years ago. I hadn't seen it in years. And I'm going through it. I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm like, whoa, I said they put this right in the cartoon. I mean, not the cartoon. They put this right in the. Saturday morning TV show, and we didn't know they were talking about us and, and our ancestors in, in African culture. So it's not, it's, it's hidden in plain sight. It's not like, uh, it's right in front of you. You just have to know what it is that you're looking at. We have to become uh, history detectives and be able to decode the symbols. Okay. So one of the things I use now, you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in the class. I, I, I use these as reference, but I use a um, symbols encyclopedia also. OK, um, this is signs and symbols an illustrated guide to their origins and meanings because the symbols tie into history, tie into culture that gives you a better understanding of people's history and culture, understanding their symbols. OK. And on the front is Africa. OK, you, you have a pyramid. You have this right here from the metal netter. You got the eye of Heru from the metal netter. All this, this is Africa on the front. OK, then on the back, then you open it to the first page. Now, I got this from Barnes and Noble. So this wasn't I didn't have to climb to the top of uh, uh, Mount Kenya, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. You know, I didn't have to time to the, climb to the top of that to get this book. I bought this from Barnes and Nobles. A white owned bookstore. It was just, they just had it there. It was like ten dollars. They just had it there. You know, you would think the the clan would be uh, around it, blocking it, trying to block you from getting it, and uh, you know, a bunch of white supremacists were trying to hide it and things like that. No, it was, it was just there. Had a stick on it, ten dollars. I said, I need this. I'm gonna get this one. You know, walked out. Nobody tackled me. Right? <laughs> they weren't trying to keep the information away from me. <laughs> so you see this on the front then you open it the first page i got this august 2011 the first page is africa is ancient africa that's heru <laughs> from the from the holy trinity of asar or said heru that's right on that's right on the first page heru ancient kemet so then you look at the back is ancient africa on the back and then right in the middle is an ankh 
the African symbol for the African key of life, the African symbol for eternal life, the arm. It's right on the back. Africa on the front, on the back, first page. This is right there in plain sight. <laughs> so you, there are a number of different symbols encyclopedias you can get or symbols dictionaries, okay? This is um this is one that I use. There's some other ones that are good. I'm not saying this is the only one. Uh this is by uh Covenant. This is by Covent Garden Books. Covent Garden Books. This is called um Signs and Symbols, an illustrated guide to their origins and meanings. Signs and symbols, an illustrated guide to their origins and meanings. It's a full color. It's full color. This is only like ten dollars. Okay. This full. They tell you so. They give you background information on about two thousand different symbols from all around the world. So this is dealing with Celtic and Nordic deities. Okay. So you get something like this. So then you can start. Un better understanding a lot of this information. All right. How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? Okay. Uh, we got Chris, we've got Kelly. Uh, all right. So our, our class meets Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sometimes we go over. This is the first class we went, we went a little over, but they're all archived. You can watch live. They're all archived. You can go back and watch them over and over again. Um, so our Tuesday, February 23rd class, uh, Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans with Africans Documented Evidence, will be our guest speaker. And you can register at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's regularly uh, $130. It's on sale $80. And, it's, and there's bonus content that you can watch also. We just posted the link here as well. Now, you can use this for your children if you want to. I would say it's PG-13 because we're dealing with the transatlantic slave trade, because we're dealing with war, we're dealing with slavery. Um, I'm not vulgar. I don't do a lot of cursing, if any cursing. I may cuss out a slave master once, but <laughs> it's not vulgar. It's not crazy. I, I would say it's PG-13, okay? Oh, maybe 12 years old, all right? But it's very informative and it's visual as well, okay? Uh, Kelly said, I love learning about signs and symbols. Okay, like you said, it's right there in plain sight. Yeah, it is. It's right there. It's right there in plain sight. You just have to know what you're looking at. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna take you back to some of the things we deal with. We'll talk a little bit about Dr. David M. Hotel as well. Okay, so we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans, known as the Moors. Shocking archaeological discoveries. Uh, we talk about the insurance companies. Understanding the insurance companies and role the insurance companies played on insuring not just slave ships but also Africans on um, plantations here in the U.S. especially, okay? And we know the uh, you had an insurance company called the Nautilus Life Insurance Company, which started in about 1845, and they became known as the New York Life Insurance Company. In their first three years of existence, they insured, um, you know, African slaves on the plantations because there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. And a lot of that work, working in sawmills and different things, it was very dangerous, okay? So you had slave owners taking out insurance policies on slaves on the plantation. So if they died, you know, working or something like that, they died, they could cash in on their insurance policy, go buy another one or more than one. So, and we know they were enslaving slave ships as well, okay? Various insurance companies were uh, enslaving slave ships, in not just in the U.S., but also in England, et cetera. Okay, uh, let's continue here. All right, so we deal with uh, insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations. Uh, I deal with... Freemasonry, America, and the Founding Fathers. This ties right into ancient Kim and ancient Egypt and the Nile Valley region of Africa. Freemasonry, America, and the Founding Fathers. The origins of the term America, Africa, and more. Uh, we'll also deal with the uh, fake Willie Lynch letter of 1712, because Willie Lynch never historically existed. The problem with slave movies, why are we being bombarded with slave movies and slave TV shows? Even though understanding the history of slavery is important, there's so much other history to make movies about 
ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, Nubia, Ethiopia. You know, I'm still waiting on a movie about uh, Emperor Menelik II uh, defeating the de defeating the Italians in 1896 at the Battle of Adawa. And then the Italians lying to the rest of the world saying that the Ethiopians were white because they didn't want them to know. They didn't want the world to know that the Italians were defeated by Africans. You know, we, we can have movies about Mansa Musa and Ghana and Shanghai and Mali. And there's all types of movies that we can have uh, before slavery even came into existence. Uh, we do with Arsar, Arset and Heru and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story. Links to ancient Kemet, Egypt, and early Christianity, Freemasonry in America, the fake Willie Lynch letter, 1712. Like I said, Willie Lynch never historically existed. Uh, so th that's a brief overview. Now, this is Dr. David M. Hotep. He wrote the book, The First Americans for Africans, Documented Evidence. His book is backed up by 713 footnotes of a uh, uh, thoroughly documented in African presence uh, in this country going back at least 51,700 years and in South America going back at least 56,000 years ago. His new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited, which will be out by the end of March 2021. Uh, has new research and it blows those dates out the water. Okay, it pushes those dates back even more. Uh, at least a hundred thousand years in in South America and somewhere to, to about uh, two hundred and twenty five thousand three hundred fifty thousand years ago in uh, Mexico. But on page fourteen of his book, he talks about a discovery made in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear. Dr. Albert Goodyear is a geologist at the University of South Carolina, okay? And they found um, 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 15,000, uh, at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava. Genetic M174D haploid uh, groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found uh, uh, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, uh, structures, and tools. 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least uh, 51,700 years ago. Okay. Now, if we continue here, you can read this article for yourself. This came out in uh, 2004, okay, 17 years ago. November 18th, 2004, from ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com is a scientific uh, uh, website. They have scientific uh, discoveries, their articles about them, etc. So they had this article name new evidence puts man in north america fifty thousand years ago new evidence puts man in north america fifty thousand years ago and this deals with dr albert goodyear's discovery so here's a picture of dr albert goodyear he's a white archaeologist okay and he, uh this this is a summary of the article it says radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where well, artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. All right. Well, these were the Khoisan. OK, Native Americans don't exist at this time. These were Khoisan who come from southern Africa and they go all around the world. And um, they're the ancestors to the Ainu, the Ainu and the Twa, and they were here in this land also. Now, one of the things that I do uh, also in the class, I make the connection between the movie Black Panther and this ancient history. And we did this in um, last week's last week's cl uh, class. Because I did extensive research on the movie Black Panther, all right? And these were two books. And you, some of you have seen some of the lectures I've done dealing with the film Black Panther. 
I deal with what the word Wakanda means. Wakanda is an ancient word. Wakanda, we find the word Wakanda in the uh, Native American language. It's the Omaha Ponca language and the Sioux Indian language, and it means possesses secret powers. Okay. Uh, Wakanda is also a key Congo word. And key Congo is one of the Bantu languages. Bantu is a group of about 500 languages spoken in Southern Africa, East Africa, and all the way West to like Cameroon. Um, Kwanzaa is Kiswahili. Kiswahili is a Bantu language. So all this is, is connected. Uh, but I read these two books here. Uh, this is uh, from Marvel, Black Panther, The Ultimate Guide. This deals with the I liked about the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book, something like that, because I had to study the history of the Black Panther comic book to understand the movie. Then this book here, this is the official tie in to the movie um, uh, from Marvel called Black Panther, which gives background information on the movie, talks about the characters, things like this. So I, 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 re I read these and read over 100 articles dealing with the film Black Panther and the comic book to better un so I could understand the movie and do my lectures on it. But the film ties directly into African history, African culture, African language, spiritual systems. So I incorporate some of that into the class as well. OK, because all of this is connected. All right. Now, this uh, discovery here, this was in the New York Times. Um, in the class, I show you a, a video clip of Dr. David M. Hotel. He was interviewed by uh, WKRP in Cincinnati Channel 5 in 2011. And he talked about this discovery from uh, that, that appeared in the New York Times. And this deals with on the Greek island of Crete. OK, on the Greek island of Crete over uh, two summers. And the name of this article is, is called On Crete, New Evidence of Very Ancient Mariners. On Crete, New Evidence of Very Ancient Mariners. This is from the New York Times. This is. Um, from uh, February 15th, 2010, okay? And it says that um, it says uh, stone tools on the Greek island of Crete uh, over the course of two summers were found and archaeologists say at, uh, these stone tools are at least 130,000 years old, okay? So they did uh, uh, excavations uh, uh, for for uh, two two the, over the course of two summers, and they found stone tools that date back 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence of strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean, and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. So, one of the things I talk about is is how uh, we know at least 100,000 years of our history has been stolen. This is an example of it because uh, scholars like Renoko Rashidi, who I know is a friend of mine, uh, Renoko, and uh, Renoko has written numerous books. OK, this is one of his books that he's written. And this is one of the books I use as reference in the class um, when we deal with the history of the Moors. Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. Once again, you don't have to buy any of these books. You can. Renoko would probably love it if you do. So if you want to, you can, but you don't have to feel like you have to buy the book to understand the class. Uh, and you can visit Renoko's uh, website. I think it's drrenoko.com. He has a lot of good information there. Um, drrenoko.com. Dr. We'll pull up his website here also. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Renoko.com is uh, Renoko's website. Okay. And you can follow Renoko Rashidi and uh, uh, buy his, uh, get information about how to buy his books and things like that. Okay. Dr. Renoko.com. Uh, and uh, we'll flip over to uh, Renoko's website so you can check him out. Follow him on Facebook as well. Renoko has been to about 125 islands and countries around the world. He has a personal library, of probably something like 40,000 photographs he's taken. OK, so this is his website. Go to drrenoko.com, R-U-N-O-K-O. -O, all right. OK, so let's continue here.
Um, let me see. Do I have the right one? Okay, yeah, we got the right one. So with this discovery here, uh, we know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen as well. And this this is a discovery that shows that also. So they said this uh, uh, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the tool makers must, ha must have arrived by boat, must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. Previous artifact discoveries had shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other uh, Greek islands, and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. So this is causing them to have to rethink everything. So they have to push, they have to come to the realization that the Africans were sailing over 100,000 years prior to what they thought. We had the technology, we were sailing, we had already, we were circumnavigating the globe 100,000 years earlier than the experts thought. Okay, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. They keep having to back that thing up. They keep having to back the timelines up. All right. Let's continue. Okay, so we deal with, you know, the Druids. And uh, th so this is deep because this ties into a whole period of history with the Greeks and the Roman soldiers going into Ireland. And it deals with a period of time when Ireland is a colony of the, of the Roman Empire. This is in um, uh, fourth and fifth century AD. Um, and this ties into a British slave named Patrick who was sent into Ireland to convert the Irish to Christianity. Okay. Um, Pope Celestine uh, the first in uh, 392. I think it was 392. Uh, A.D. sends a British, a British slave named Patrick into Ireland to convert the Irish to uh, Catholicism, okay? But at this point in time, you don't have, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 432, 432. I'm thinking something else, 392 A.D., uh, 432 A.D., Pope Celestine I sends a British slave named Patrick into Ireland to convert the uh, Irish to Catholicism. And you have the Druids there. The Druids are these priests who are dealing with a watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kim and out of ancient Egypt. And this causes what they're teaching causes a conflict with the Christian church. Now, at this point in time, contrary to popular belief, because this is 432 A.D., this is after the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which is like the first of, uh, of about 21 ecum ecumenical councils between 325 AD and 1870 that shaped the way Christianity is practiced, believed, what is taught, etc. At this point in time, the Catholic Church does not exist. This is the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Catholic Church does not come into existence until mid 11th century AD, right around 1052, something like that, because I have a book on Catholic history in the in the other room. Um, there was uh, what book was I about to show you? Uh, do, 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 do. I don't remember. OK, it'll come to me. But anyway, oh. The. Oh, yeah, the book on Irish history, so. What happened was a few uh, some years ago, I think about 2012, 2013, I was doing a lecture on the history of St. Patrick's Day. So I had to study some Irish history to understand St. Patrick and history of St. Patrick's Day. So I read this book, The Everything Irish History and Heritage Book. This is one of the sources. The Everything History and, and Irish Heritage Book by uh, Amy Hackney, Blackwell, and Ryan Hackney. So this gives this gives a good overview of Irish history and the chronology of Irish history so you can better understand things. Uh, and Ireland was a, used to be a colony of the Roman Empire, 
then we know Ireland is going to become a colony of England around 12th century AD also, okay? But Patrick was, uh, he goes in and kills thousands of Druids on behalf of the Christian church. He was a mass murderer. Patrick was, he was a mass murderer on behalf of the Christian church. Uh, so we, we deal with this in the class and uh, Browder talks about this in Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Okay, which is a fantastic book. A lot of people have this book uh, on your shelf. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. This is one of the sources in the book. I'm going to show you some stuff in here that's going to blow your mind. Okay? So if you haven't read this in a few years, I've read it twice. I'm going to go back through and read it again because we're, we're coming up to the, that section of, uh, of the class. I'm going to go through and read this again. This one here, and this is another book from Browder that I, that I use, um, Egypt on the Potomac. Okay? Egypt on the Potomac. And that book is here somewhere. Because I've got like five stacks of books here and a, a small bookshelf behind me. Where's Egypt on the Potomac? Okay, it's around here somewhere. Oh, I'm still trying to figure out where I put stuff because uh, after one of my radio shows uh, last week, I spent some hours trying to clean up the office. And uh, then I couldn't find anything after I cleaned stuff up and threw stuff away and everything. I couldn't find anything. Okay. Here's, here's Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. This is an excellent book. We'll talk about Egypt on the Potomac in just a minute here because uh, we're about to wrap up. Okay. How's everybody doing? Uh, once again, you can register for uh, the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, it's an eight-week, 16-hour online course. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, uh, taking place as well. Uh, we'll post the link here. Uh, the, it, so it's on sale, uh, $80, uh, regularly $130. All the sessions, are we do them live, but they're all recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. You can also go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and it's right on the homepage of our website. You can register there. Uh, as soon as you register, you can watch last week's class. Uh, last week, our guest speaker was uh, cultural anthropologist Anubia Watford. And we dealt with the origins of uh, ancient Kush and the um, uh, African queens of antiquity. OK, in our Tuesday, February 23rd class, our guest speaker will be Dr. David M. Hotel, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. OK, let's continue here. Uh, and then also you can um, if you just want to register for uh, the one class with Dr. David M. Hotel, it's going to be fifteen dollars. I have to set that up. You can do that. Uh, also, if you, if you have any questions, email me at AHN show. At African History Network dot com, AHN show at African History Network dot com. OK, a lot of people were asking me, what am I doing for African-American History Month? I'm not traveling because of COVID. I'm not speaking out of town. So I'm, I'm teaching my online course. Last time I taught this class was uh, 2019. And there's been a lot of information that's come out since then. Okay. Uh, so let's continue quickly here. Uh, let's see here. It, so we talk about the Moors. We, have to, we definitely have to talk about the Moors. And this ties into, this leads us up to the transatlantic slave trade, the 800-year occupation of the Africans known as the Moors. They lose control of their last stronghold, Granada in Spain, January 2nd, 1492. They're taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe. You know, uh, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, who's, who's one of my teachers says that to, uh, to understand the history of something, you first must understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence, right? The Moors are teaching, taking the teachings of the Nile Valley region of Africa, of ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, into Europe, and it's bringing Europe out of the Dark Ages. They go in in 711 AD. They go into um, what was then known as the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, because it wasn't called Spain and Portugal then. And they're teaching the math, the science, they're taking the periodic tables in, they're taking in something called alchemy, that today we call chemistry. They're taking in new types of foods. Uh, they're taking in alcohol, teaching Europeans how to bathe teaching them how to read and write because about 
85 to 90 percent of Europeans, when they go in 8th century AD, are illiterate. Okay, you had kings and queens who were illiterate, who couldn't read and write. Uh, but when we look at something like this here, and this shows the connection between ancient Kemet and Freemasonry, Egypt of the West. Okay, so um, we see the Tekken, or what the Greeks called an obelisk. We see this in ancient Kemet. And there are about 1,200 Tekkenu uh, in ancient Kemet. Today, they're only about 12 or so. Uh, but that's the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument is an obelisk or a Tekken. It's a symbol of resurrection that comes from the mythology of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And we see this in Freemasonry, okay? Because the, uh, the Moors are taking these teachings into Europe they're teaching this to the Europeans, and this is going to form the foundation of Freemasonry, a watered-down version of what they're teaching. is going to, you know, form the foundation of Freemasonry. Uh, we know that they're going to teach this to a group that's going to be called the Knights Templar. Uh, they're founded in uh, 1118 AD during the Second Crusades, also known as the Poor Knights of Christ, who become known as the Knights Templar. They become very, very powerful. And then uh, October 13th, uh, 1307 in France, you're going to have a group that's rounded up and, and they're going to be disbanded, they're going to be rounded up and tortured and disbanded. Um, and this was said to be the day, the day that the knowledge stopped. This was said to be the day that the knowledge stopped. It was on a Friday. This is one of the reasons why Friday uh, the 13th is said to be an unlucky number. It's not the only reason. It's one of the reasons. So uh, this ties into frigatrice. Frigatrisca decaphobia, which is the fear of the number 13. So this is something we talk about in the class because that then ties into the, the uh, Knights Templar, which ties into the history of the Moors. So when uh, this word that I had here, uh, when we were talking about the Druids, uh, Frigatrisca decaphobia, that's the fear of the number, uh, that's the fear of Friday the 13th. And uh, Frigga or Freya or Freya was the wife of Odin. Odin in uh, Nordic mythology and Odin the father of Thor. And when you study the origins of the days of the week, and we'll talk about this in the class, when you study the origins of the days of the week, they tie into, uh, 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 some of them tie into Nordic mythology. And uh, Friday is named after Freya. It was Freya's day or Freya's day, who was the wife of Odin. Okay? So all this it, it, all of this stuff is connected. Different cultures are connected. Histories are connected. So you have to understand the chronology of history. So the days of the week that we use today, like Thursday was called Thor's day, T-H-O-R, Thor, the, 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 the god of thunder, who's a copy of um, Shango from uh, uh, Ifa, which is the spiritual system practice amongst the Yoruba, like in Nigeria. Uh, all this is connected. This is why you have to understand the chronology of history. All of this is connected. So we see uh, Thor and the Avengers movies from Marvel, things like this. That's who Thursday is named after. All right. Yeah, you have to study the etymology of words. Okay, look up these words in the dictionary. You can go to Merriam-Webster online. Look at these words in the dictionary and study the etymology of words. Okay, so when we look at Freemasonry, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Uh, Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light, child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify, um, was first used to identify Students who com who completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. Read pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Hey, how you doing, Kelly? Okay, thanks for the donation, Kelly. Uh, just so you all know, um, I appreciate the donation. If you want to donate, if you can do it through Cash App or PayPal, it's better than YouTube because YouTube keeps 30% of our donations. Okay. 
when you donate through YouTube, they keep 33% of the donation. If you donate through Cash App or PayPal, um, except for the like the little transaction fee, I get like 98% of that. Okay. Um, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. We just posted the link here. Or paypal.me forward slash the AHN show through PayPal. Also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the homepage. That way we get more of it. It helps us more because YouTube keeps a third of it. And if you do it through PayPal, um, if you do it through Cash App, yeah, be sure to type in dollar sign the AHN show unless you're clipping on my link because somebody set up a fake African History Network Cash App account. And theirs is dollar sign the AHN, which is not me, but they made it look like mine. So I got to investigate this to see how much money of our money that they took. I just found out about this last week. Somebody was trying to send money through Cash App to register for the class. And I'm sitting waiting on the money come in, waiting on the money come in. I'm talking to her. And then she sent me um a screenshot of where she sent it to. That's how I found out somebody set up a fake Cash App account. And they used our logo and all this. So I gotta navigate through that. Okay. So ours is dollar sign the AHN show. Do cash out. Kelly said that's a shame. I was I was like, who the uh, dollar sign the AHN show through cash app. Okay. Um okay, let's continue here. So did you uh, did you know that 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence uh and 13 of the 39 signers of the US Constitution were Freemasons? Did you know that four of the uh First five U.S. presidents were Freemasons, and there have been 14 Freemasons who have been U.S. presidents. Okay, so check out page 18 of Egypt on a Potomac by Tony Browder. Browder also talks about uh, Benjamin Banneker. Banneker was a bad brother, and it's believed that Banneker's, um, I think it was his grandfather, was Dogon. And when you study the Dogon, see, because you see, African people did not uh stay stagnant we migrated so africans migrate from the Nile valley region of africa into central africa into west africa so when you study the dogon and face to face africa.com has articles about the dogon um the dogon originally come from ancient kemet ancient egypt and they have a superior knowledge of astronomy and we know um uh benjamin banneker he helps uh, designed to lay out and, and do the survey, surveying for Washington, D.C., okay? And one of the things that Egypt on the Potomac deals with, Tony Browder, is how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Egypt. And he deals with the symbolism in Washington, D.C. that comes straight out of ancient Kemet. And we have to understand the, the, the free... Um, the knowledge is taken into Europe by the African Moors. They're taking the knowledge from the Nile Valley region of Africa. They're going into Europe, teaching this to Europeans. The Knights Templar get this information. The Knights Templar are going to be disbanded. That that knowledge is going to resurface as the like the Yorkshire rights of the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, uh, th these different secret societies or societies with secrets. And then it's going to come to this land here when you have the founding of the, the colonies and the founding fathers and they're setting up Washington, D.C. and drafting the Declaration of Independence and the uh, U.S. Constitution. Many of them were Freemasons. So they're bringing that information here and that symbolism as well. OK. Um, Okay, so so let's talk about all this. This is just a preview, okay? And uh, okay, so let's get it. so then that then that all that then ties into why Christmas is celebrated on December twenty fifth, and this ties into the winter solstice and Yeshua or Jesus being born on December twenty fifth of a virgin birth, which then goes back to Asar, Aset, and Heru. All of this is connected. OK, and we deal with the uh, etymology of the word Jesus takes you back to Yeshua, which is Hebrew. 
but the letter J did not exist until 1630 AD. The letter J is derived from the uh, letter I. So when you look up the letter J in like an encyclopedia or Encyclopedia Britannica online or something like that, they give you this history. So one of the mistakes people make is that we think the way things are today is the way they've always been. And that's not true. OK, to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the preexistence of existence. When. The Helios Biblos was written or the holy book and Helios Biblos means sun book. Because you're dealing with the travel of the sun throughout the constellations and these different stories and things like that told about the travel of the sun throughout the constellations. And that's something that uh, Dr. John G. Jackson deals with in Christianity before Christ and really understanding all this and how uh, a lot of these stories are told in allegorical form because you can take, not to make this too deep, but I can take you straight from the Helios Biblos, from the Holy Bible, straight back to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Draw a direct line. It's still there. It's still there in the book. It's still there in the book. Um, but anyway, so those are some of the things we deal with. It, it, this, it, it's all connected. Uh, okay, so here, here's some background information on African American History Month. Okay, and once again, um, we'll post a link here. Who still who still needs to register for the online course? As soon as you register, you can start watching um, uh, last week's class. And we do the classes live, but they're all archived. You can go back and watch them over and over again. There's also bonus content. It's a eight week, sixteen hour online course that I teach: Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay. So we're posting here. Um, so the class is eighty dollars. If you want to just register for this one class, um, the Tuesday, February twenty third class, uh, that class is fifteen dollars. It's archived. You'll be able to go back and watch it over and over again. And uh, email me also if you just want to register for the one class. Okay, but a lot of people want to register for all all the classes. And uh, you can there's bonus content, and you can watch last week's class as soon as you register for the full course. Um, so if we look at some background information on Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and I've studied Dr. Woodson a lot. I read Dr. Payroll back, back Bovey's book on uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, and I do presentations dealing with the origins of African American History Month also. Okay. And uh, where's Woodson's book? Dak Bovey's book. It was right here. Oh, yeah, right here. This is an excellent book dealing with Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., the father of black history. Dr. Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., the father of black history. OK. And uh, Dak Bovey is a history professor at Michigan State University. But here's some background uh, information. Because everybody says, why do we have the shortest month of the year, the coldest month of the year? Why do we need a Black History Month? Things like this. So, uh, you know, Dr. Woodson was born in um, uh, 1875. He was born 10 years after slavery ended, born to uh, two former slaves. Um, and he goes on to get a Ph.D. from Harvard. He gets uh, two master's degrees. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, two bachelor's degrees, one from Berea College, one from University of Chicago. He gets his master's degree from the University of Chicago, and he gets a, a, a Ph.D. from Harvard in American history in 1912. Uh, Dr. Woodson founded Negro History Week in 1926. So it started uh, the second week in February. It was February 7th, 1926. Uh, Dr. Woodson explained the reason behind the celebration in a pamphlet widely distributed months before the first celebration was to was to take place during the second week in February. Um, and he and the reason why it was in the second week of February is because uh, the second week of February commemorated the birth dates of Frederick Douglass, um, whose assumed, bir assumed birth date was February 14th, and Abraham Lincoln, whose birthday was February 12th. So African Americans were already celebrating the birth dates of Ab uh, Frederick Douglass, um, going back to when he when he died in 1895, and uh, Abraham Lincoln. They were already celebrating those birthdays during that second week in February. So 
Dr. Woodson put his new uh, cultural celebration within that period of time because celebrations were already taking place. Dr. Woodson exclaimed that blacks knew practically nothing about their history. He ultimately believed that African-Americans could benefit immensely from knowledge of their past and accomplish, uh, accomplishments of their ancestors. He added that race prejudice was the byproduct of white's beliefs that black people had not contributed anything of worth to civilization, had not contributed anything of worth to civilization, which is completely wrong. There's also an annual theme each year for African American History Month. This year's annual theme is the black family um, representation, identity, and diversity. Okay. And uh, Asala's, at Asala's website, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, they have information for uh, this year's uh, annual theme for African American History Month. Okay, so Dr. Woodson argued that if the historical record was set straight, and if, um, hold on, what did, what did I just do? Okay, uh, Dr. Woodson argued that if the historical record was, was set straight, and if the history of black people were studied along with the achievements of others in schools, okay, having it incorporated into the curriculum, not only would African-American youth develop a sense of pride and self-worth as we dealt with early, early in the presentation. And we showed those studies that show the correlation between African-American children studying their history and understanding their history, and it boosted their self-esteem and academic performance. The history of black people was studied along with the achievements of others in schools. Not only would black youth develop a sense of pride and self-worth, but racism would be would also be abolished. Dr. Woodson concluded, quote, let truth destroy the dividing prejudice of nationality and teach universal love without distinction of race, merit or rank with sublime enthusiasm and heavenly vision of the great teacher let us help men rise above the race hate of their age unto the altruism of a rejuvenated universe okay so negro history week was the first major achievement in popularizing black history and was unique in that negro history week focused on african-american youth dr woodson realized that the miseducation of african-americans began in their homes, in their communities, and in their elementary schools. Dr. Woodson's vision of Negro History Week was optimistic, strategic, and long-term. Optimistic, strategic, and long-term. He wanted this modest week-long celebration to serve as a stepping stone toward the gradual introduction of Black history into the curricula of all levels of the U.S. educational system. Because Dr. Woodson said that the history of African Americans had to be taught in every school across the country, not just the schools we went to, not just the schools where we had African American principals or African American teachers. He said the history, our history had to be taught in, school, in every school across the country because that influences what people know about you, influences what they think about you. What they think about you influences how they treat you. And, and one of the problems that we're having is that when we have to go to lawmakers to get our issues addressed, because politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, adoption, interpretation, and enforcement, when we have to go to lawmakers, to get policies put in place to deal with our issues. Oftentimes you're dealing with people who are ignorant of your history. This is one of the reasons why you can't get reparations because most of the people in the House of Representatives and U.S. Senate don't even think a debt is owed because they're ignorant of history. This is why America needs a massive history lesson. America has to have a massive reorientation. OK, I'm going to show you another uh, article after we finish this here dealing with Woodson that ties into that, because right now, in state legislatures, five state legislatures there, uh, you know, Republicans are passing bills to 
uh, control and restrict what teachers can teach about racism and injustice and oppression. And, but they want to teach from the 1776 project that has been thoroughly debunked. Uh, so Dr. Woodson hoped that Negro uh, History Week would evolve into Negro History Year as he affirmed from time to time. Woodson consistently instructed those observing the week that they needed to diligently prepare for the celebration months in advance, not just recycle the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every February. We have to stop doing that. There's an annual theme each year for African-American History Month to give you direction, to give you purpose. It's not the celebrate is not just talking about runaway slaves and how hard we had it and things like this. So Dr. Woodson instructed those observing the week that they needed to diligently prepare for the celebration months in advance, and that after mid-February, after mid-February, um after mid-February, they needed to continue acknowledging the role of African descendants in world history. So it wasn't just uh, studying the accomplishments and achievements of African people in this country. We're talking about around the world and understanding the African diaspora. Dr. Woodson said Negro History Week should be a demonstration of what has been done in the study of the Negro during the year and at the same time as a demonstration, at the same time as a demonstration of greater things to be accomplished. This is what Woodson instructed school teachers. He said a subject which receives attention one week out of the 36 will not mean much to anyone because so Many of us have African-American History Month backwards. We think this is the only time of the year we're supposed to teach our history or study our history, something like that. And Dr. Woodson was telling school teachers, no, this is a, this you're supposed to teach this year round. Negro History Week, that one week in February, second week in Feb February, that's a time for students to show and demonstrate what they have been studying all year. We know his most famous book, he wrote numerous books. His most famous book was The Miseducation of the Negro, came out in 1933. As I said before, I, I, I've seen very few pictures of Dr. Woodson actually smiling. He may have a quarter smile or a half smile, but you know, a real big smile. I've seen very few pictures of Dr. Woodson actually smiling. All right, and we know uh, uh, Dr. Francis Quest Wilson and Nilly Fuller taught us if you do not understand European white supremacy and racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you. Okay, uh, so I want to uh, show these last two articles here uh, for the sake of time. If we look here, let's see, let's go to Asala's website, asala.org, A-S-A-L-H.org, asala.org. So on their website, they have information uh, dealing, if you go to annual themes, uh, they have information dealing with uh, the annual theme for African American History Month. And they have information dealing with the annual themes going back to 1928. So this year's annual theme for uh, Black History Month, African American History Month, is the Black Family Representation, Identity, and Diversity. OK, and then they give a write up an explanation of that, break, break that down. And you can shape um, events and panel discussions and presentations throughout the year based upon this information right here. And you can also they have a printable PDF that you can download as well. OK, so this is the annual theme. Uh, 2019, it was uh, um dealing with the year of return, 2019. It was black migrations, it was black migrations, 1619 to 2019. Uh, the 2020 annual theme was African-Americans and the vote because 2020 was the subsequent centennial or 100, 150th anniversary of the uh, 15th Amendment. 
which guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men. Okay, uh, lastly, let's look at uh, this article here. This is from news1.com, and this ties into what I was talking about. Um, the state legislature is trying to control what's being taught in what's being taught in school, dealing with history. Republican proposed bills want to prevent teaching students about injustice. Bills in several states want to limit teaching about racism and oppression, adopting the framing of the debunked 1776 commission report. Uh, this article is from February 5th, 2021. Okay. Uh, what the heck is this? Okay, so check out this article here. Uh, they talk about the now disbanded 1776 uh, commission report. The now disbanded 1776 uh, commission report and Republican lawmakers in several states are moving forward with uh, legislation that would implement similar uh, efforts. Uh, bills proposed in Arkansas, Iowa, and Mississippi prevent the use of the 1619 project from the New York Times as part of teaching the legacy of slavery. The Arkansas legislature is considering two bills that would limit racial justice in the curriculum. House Bill 1231 would prevent uh, schools from using the 1619 project as part of the curriculum. House Bill 1218 goes a step further by preventing uh, lessons that promote the overthrow of the U.S. government, division between certain groups of people, or social justice for certain groups, including race, gender, political affiliation, and class. Okay, so read this article here from uh, news1.com. Uh, Republican proposed bills want to prevent teaching students about injustice. Uh, there's also one from um, USA Today that I've talked about on my show. Let's see, there's one from USA Today, uh, Slavery History. What's the name of this one here? Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. This is from February 10th, 2021. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. So this ties into the one from uh, news1.com. Uh, lawmakers in several state houses this year want to stop, want to stop uh, lesson plans that focus on the centrality of slavery to American history as presented in the New York Times 1619 Project, pre previewing new battles in states over control of civics education. Republican lawmakers in Arkansas, Iowa, Mississippi, Missouri, and South Dakota filed bills last month that if enacted would cut funding to K-12 schools and colleges that provide lessons derived from the award-winning project of the 1619 Project. The South Dakota bill has since been withdrawn. Okay, so read this article also. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project, okay? So all this is in the news right now. All this ties into our history. A lot of this is happening during African American History Month as well, okay? All right, so um, you can register for uh, the online course. If you go to my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, we've posted the link here uh, to register. But if you go to my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, it's right on the home page. Uh, let's see, you scroll down, you'll see the information for my radio show. I'm on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight. Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We broadcast on our Facebook fan page and YouTube. Also, you can download the iHeartRadio app and search for 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF. That's the radio station I'm on. You can also search for the African History Network show because they have uh, audio podcasts of our shows. Then we have the information here for the online course. Okay. It's an eight-week, 16-hour online course that I teach Tuesday, February 23rd 
our guest speaker will be Dr. David M. Hotel, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited, he'll talk about that. You click on register here, it takes you to the next page here, and then um, click right here on enroll, okay? And as soon as you register, you can uh, start watching the content and start watching last week's class and it's bonus content also, okay? All right. Uh, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Uh, remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now,